to pave the way for driverless cars. Candidates for Illinois Comptroller are here to talk about paying the state bills and more. Chicago already has some high profile tech businesses entrenched in the city. But now there's a brand new initiative to turn the city into a top tier center for technology. The low line is really about uh, reimagining public space. A look at a new pedestrian path that's set below train tracks. Hi, I'm Alpina Singh and welcome to Check Please. And it's almost time to toast the return of two WTTW favorites, Check Please and host Alpina Singh, who joins us tonight. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. The public weighs in again on police reform. Paris Schutz has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Paris. Phil, today is the second and final day for the public to verbally give their thoughts on the Chicago police consent decree before a federal judge. Like yesterday, dozens of speakers from different walks of life made their feelings known on the agreement that would provide a federal monitor to oversee reforms at the police department. Now, the public can weigh in with written statements until November 2nd. Federal Judge Robert Dow will later issue his final ruling on the agreement that was forged between Mayor Emanuel and Illinois Attorney General Lisa Madigan. Mayoral candidate Bill Daly is calling for term limits in the office should he be elected. The 70-year-old Daly, whose brother and father served a combined 43 years as mayor, unveiled his two-term limit proposal in an interview with the Tribune this afternoon as part of his ethics proposal. Daly is also calling for a ban on campaign fundraising during his first three years in office and an independent commission to redraw the city's ward maps every 10 years. That would take political consideration off the equation. A high-tech new addition to the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology, or IIT. Mayor Emanuel and Senator Dick Durbin were on hand today to open the new so Ed Kaplan Family right? Institute for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship. IIT says the building is more like an experimental laboratory for students, faculty, alumni, and businesses, and will also house the school's Institute for Design. This is a place, a launching pad, where our students will have an opportunity to create ideas and have those ideas take shape, to have their businesses be born and ultimately their dreams to come true. It's the first new building on IIT's campus in 40 years. Well, CVS Pharmacy wants consumers to know how to get rid of unwanted prescription drugs to prevent abusing them. The company is partnering with Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart to provide information on the county's drug take-back program. The information will be printed on the packaging of prescription drugs at 150 CVS stores throughout the county. They're the first people in the country that we know of who have done this, that namely every single prescription that goes out is going to have this notice with it. And the notice is going to say, here's what you can do, here's how you do it. And with that, we are expecting exponentially to see this thing take off and grow even more so. As for the weather tonight, cloudy with a slight chance of rain and a low around 42. Then tomorrow, cloudy with a 40% chance of rain and a high near 52. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. Now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Paris. There is still a long road ahead, but a new state program is beginning to pave the way for testing driverless cars. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here and, as always, is ready to go full speed ahead to share the latest. Amanda, what's going on? Phil, Chicago streets filled with cars and passengers, but no drivers. May sound like something out of the Jetsons, but there are those who suggest the technology actually has roots in Illinois' not-so-distant past. Back in the 1970s in a small company called Caterpillar. It was many of these tech innovations which they pioneered that are the foundational and fundamental basis of the futuristic vehicles we now see at auto and tech shows around the country, as well as right behind us here in the parking lot today. What we saw in the parking lot may well be the future. Products of Illinois companies, including trucks outfitted with technology like 360 degree cameras that may one day be headed down the highway without a person in the driver's seat. 
and a small electric car like this one by Innova EV. Right now, seniors in Bronzeville can get low-cost rides in these dash cars to the grocery store or to a doctor in a manual version, but the company hopes to deploy autonomous ones once they're legal here in Illinois. And Amanda, when might that be? I'm actually going to have someone else, the Secretary of Illinois' Department of Transportation, answer that question. I see a time when, when vehicles, trucks, and others will be completely self-driving. Uh, it's not tomorrow, uh, but I think that is where we are going. That is where the technology is headed. Uh, again, we've got to figure out the safety aspects of it, but I absolutely believe that's where we're headed. So when will it come here? In other words, who knows? But steps taken today will pun intended, begin to pave the way. Illinois' Governor Bruce Rauner signed an executive order that does two things. First, it launches the Autonomous Illinois Initiative. Basically, that's creating a division within IDOT to oversee development of driverless cars and related technology in Illinois. So, evaluating current law, recommending new laws, developing public-private partnerships, and so on. Second, it creates a testing program in which the state will work with companies that want to essentially get the show, their product, on the roads, literally. But no driverless vehicles yet. The program will facilitate legal testing and programs on public roadways or state highways where a licensed driver remains behind the wheel and able to take control of the vehicle at all times. That isn't happening now? That is not happening. Well, it may well be, but there's really no way to know what sort of testing is happening. And that's part of the goal, to try to bring entities together in an organized capacity to collect data, see what needs to be done. To be clear, Illinois law now does not allow driverless cars. In Illinois, the law is very simple, that there has to be a driver behind the wheel. It doesn't say that the driver has to be driving the car. There are a lot of questions and fears about this technology, but Blankenhorn says he believes it will make traveling safer. Think of how many people you see texting and driving, for example. Probably 90% of our fatalities in Illinois are, are due to driver error. Uh, if you take that driver out of the equation, we're a safer system. Trucking can be quite dangerous. Another Chicago area company, Autobahn AI, outfits trucks with those 360 degree cameras and GPS that I was talking about earlier that can help truck drivers see other vehicles and whatnot. But the company can also install radar, a thermal camera, and electric powered steering system. The goal, trucks that can go on autopilot on the highway. From a commercial release standpoint, um, where we can really start doing kind of mass installations, uh, I would say we're about two to three years um, away from uh, being able to reliably, without a human driver in the vehicle, automate on the highway. And the state of Illinois is actually also working with a couple of universities planning to develop a test track for autonomous freight in Rentoul. That's just outside of Champaign. Amanda, thank you. And now to Eddie Ruza on the race for Illinois Comptroller. Eddie. Phil, Illinois is only one of a handful of states that has separate treasurer and controller offices. It's mandated by the Illinois Constitution, but there has long been a push by some to merge the two offices. It's a proposal one of the current candidates for controller is advocating. But for the time being, the office is primarily charged with paying the state's bills. And as most voters probably know by now, Illinois is still struggling mightily to pay a lot of those bills. In our ongoing series of candidate forums, we're joined tonight by two of the candidates for that office. And seated in the order in which they appear on the statewide ballot are Democratic incumbent com controller Susanna Mendoza and her Republican challenger Darlene Sanger, who formerly was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. We should also mention that Libertarian candidate Claire Ball is running for Illinois Comptroller. The senior accountant for the Noble Network of Charter Schools also ran in the 2016 special election for that same position. And we'd like to hear from you while we're having our discussion tonight by tweeting your thoughts at WTTW using the hashtag Chicago Tonight or by commenting on our Facebook live stream. Thank you both very much for being here tonight. Susanna Mendoza, let's begin with what the talk is about what you're really running for because there are petitions circulating with your name on them as a potential candidate for mayor. Which job would you rather have? Well, I am very focused the next 12 days in making sure that I get reelected as the Illinois controller to continue to implement a vision that I have set forth for this office of protecting taxpayers. Um, there is, of course, a draft movement that is no secret here in 
in Chicago, and it's very flattering that so many people have asked me to consider running for mayor, And but I am telling you what I have told them, which is I am focused, I'm being controller, and while Bruce Rauner is, is the governor, I promise you one thing, I will be controller as long as he is governor for sure, because I'm the last line of defense but for taxpayers against this But that can only be until January. Do you Not guarantee necessarily. We don't know what's going to happen. as controller if you're reelected for the next four years? Do you guarantee voters that? I can't guarantee voters that I'll be around tomorrow, right? I don't think any politician can. I mean, I ask voters to... But if you are to, around for the next uh -huh. four years, will you be controller during that time if you're reelected? Again, if Bruce Rauner gets reelected, I will be controller as long as he is governor because I believe that I have been the last line of defense for taxpayers in this state and that I'm going to continue to fight for them every step of the way. Should supporters still continue circulating those petitions for mayor with your name on them? They're free to do whatever they'd like to do. I Would am you like fully, them to stop or no? I will tell you what I've told them. I am not even going to talk about the mayor's race until we know what happens with Bruce Rauner running for, gov running for governor and I hope to God that all of Illinois comes out to make sure that we have a new administration who's going to put people first and stop ruining our state's finances. Darlene Sanger, as you run for controller, uh, you are one of those who are advocating for merging the office with the treasurer's office. So wouldn't that eliminate one of those positions, perhaps even the one that, uh, that you would like to have? You know, here's, here's the bottom line. I mean, there is a lot of work to do in Illinois, and we need someone to commit four years to the work that has to be done in Illinois, and merging the two offices is a, is a piece of it. I mean, here, you know, if I hear someone saying, oh, I'm not, you know, you could, you're in front of the camera right now, tell your friends that you're running for comptroller. You're basically saying if Bruce Rauner wins, I'll stay, because if he wins, and you win for mayor, then he appoints who's the comptroller. So the bottom line through the whole thing is, you know, you're here, let's, let's say, I'm not running. Tell your friends I am, that I am not running. Well, I'm for here running for controller. But here's the, the irony of this is that the woman sitting to my left is on a mission to eliminate the office of controller is frankly it's disingenuous to to question my commitment to this job when I've put my heart and soul into defending taxpayers from your governor and am not advocating for eliminating an office that is critically important to the state of Illinois taxpayers. It's critically important to be committed to serve for four years, no matter who gets elected as governor, and you will not do but that. But you, you now, yourself are saying so that you're going to eliminate the office, so you're not so committing what, to do here's that. Here's how it works, okay? This is how it works, and, and this is where the fairness is, and this is where she's wrong. This is all about putting a constitutional amendment on the ballot so you, as the taxpayer and voter, can choose up or down. Now, you feel one way, I feel another way, I can go and, and present my arguments. What, in your and then view, you is the benefit of merging the two offices? I, it would save a lot of money, but here in Illinois, the fear has long been that giving all that power to one office could lead to corruption, which might come as a shock to some people here in Illinois. <laughs> yeah, but and what, you know, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, and here's here's the bottom line: let's get rid of the corruption in Illinois, and then we won't have to be so anxious about corruption in Illinois. And we're one of the few states that do have the two offices. And it, you know, basically this has been advocated by the Senate in 2012. They passed it unanimously to to basically to kick it to the House. And then Mike Madigan and um, the current comptroller is against letting the voter choose. Uh, why, or why not put a referendum on the ballot, Susanna Mendoza, and let uh, sure. voters decide whether there should be just one office? In, because I in think Illinois. voters need to understand first and foremost why the office exists. There's an office of the treasurer and the controller. Because back in 1952, from 1952 to 1956, we did have an individual who maintained both offices as one. That was Mr. Orville Hodge. And he did, in fact, being Illinois what it is, unfortunately, went to jail for embezzling $6.15 million. Today, the equivalent of $56 million of taxpayer dollars. As the Quincy Herald Whig said, merging these offices is a disastrous idea. It will eliminate an important check and balance that was created by the Constitution in 1970 to make sure that Illinois never had a situation again where taxpayers went to bed and might wake up having found out that their money was embezzled. One haven't more thing. One put, more th haven't you put a lot of, of uh, transparencies in place that would oversee still, the, the Comptroller's office? We we have so much more to do in the, in the uh, area of transparency. I'll remind you that when I passed the largest transparency reform in the history of the state of Illinois, Governor Rauner vetoed it. I had to unanimously override his veto, which again was the first time in the history of, the, of Illinois that a governor was overridden unanimously. And my opponent worked against the Debt Transparency Act, the largest transparency reform. We have so much more to do. But again, the There's two largest embezzlement 
government embezzlement schemes in the country. So the United States of America both happen here in Illinois in positions where so the controller and the treasurer so were Singer, the same How would person. you rate how uh, Susanna Mendoza has handled her time in the controller's office, and what would you do, do differently You know, what, I, what she has done is basically use it as a bully pulpit to bash the governor and all the work that's been done. So we have never seen a controller to the degree you have gone out there and use it as a pulpit for Madigan and yourself. Uh, for your own agendas. And why I'm saying that is that you don't see Treasurer Ferricks doing that. You didn't. You don't see Jesse White doing that. You never saw Leslie Munger do it to the degree you're doing now or Judy Bart Topinka. That's good. I have, there is a lot of work to do. And part of the work we need to do is this goes back to um, transparency. Now the transparency bill, what that had to do is basically was the, un you know, the budget stalemate. Bills were lining up. I actually worked for an agency with those bills lining up. And ba you could have gone and asked for the bill piled, but you did not. You basically said, that's I have true. to do this, and we could have reported that, because that's how it works. So the work, that's piece, a piece of it is the bill pile up, but look at our unfunded pension liabilities. Look at our retiree health care costs. But hasn't Controller Mendoza reduced the, the number of unpaid bills yes. by, by half? Yeah, by borrowing, and I, that was a good way to reduce it. You know, we borrowed at a lesser rate. We basically then paid down those that nine percent penalties issue. through a bond that issue, and a GOMB actually did the bond issue. So you have to give the governor's office credit for the bond issue that was had. But it was a good, good initiative. Here's the better one: you have you have basically passed unbalanced budgets the whole time you were in Springfield. The better way to do this is pass budgets that don't spend more than what we bring in, and then you don't have unpaid bills. Sure, go ahead, respond. So this governor, over the last two years, became the largest deficit, gov deficit spending governor in the history of our state. Had eight credit downgrades in just two years. More than, that's the fastest speed for eight credit downgrades in the history of our state. I mean, it is important to tell the truth about what's happening with the state's finances because taxpayers deserve to know how their money is being spent. That has been my job, that has been my quest, it's been my mission. And I have led a transparency revolution, which might upset people like my opponent because it does tell the truth as to the devastation that was inflicted on the people of Illinois over a 736 day budget impasse that Governor Rauner led. That's not me being political, That's, that is me standing up for the people of Illinois when nursing homes weren't being paid for 10 months before I took office, when senior citizens were being you know, at risk of losing their health care, when children with disabilities lost their health care, when businesses across the state of Illinois, many of which closed, had to lay off people by the thousands when five of our universities went into deep junk bond status. Darlene That's Sanger, telling the truth. That's in, not being over political. The last, yeah. Over the last year, you have been the legislative li liaison for the governor, um, and I don't know if you've worked uh, closely at all with the, the controller's office, but has the governor not been responsible in part for the fiscal woes that this uh, state is in right now, especially the, the pension crisis. There's, okay, so let's let's talk about that. So yes, there, you know, unbills did pile up because we didn't have a budget. And like I said, I worked for an agency and I saw those bills pile up. But here's the, here's the, here's the thing that's causing more of our budget pie to be eaten away every single day. It has to do with the unfunded pension liability. And basically, the current comptroller, her way to solve that problem, which she testified on the trip, is to tax marijuana and gaming, which gives you, gives my, basically tells me she has no clue what this problem is and how big it is and how to tackle it. And that's what I would like to share in regards to transparency. I mean, there, we just came out with the new comprehensive annual financial reports, and our assets compared to our liabilities is like $50,000 per household. That's so how huge. would you tackle the pension crisis? You know what? I've, I've tackled the pension crisis. Now, I got kicked out by the court, but I worked across the aisle with um, my good friend, colleague, still Representative Necrets, which you guys heard us come and talk about that. And we created, through three years' worth of work, a toolbox of different things that can be done to help tackle the problem. So that's... And one is reopening the Constitution, isn't that right? And, and rewording the, the obligations, the pension obligations? If that could be done, that's one way to do it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox, but we need to have the wherewithal to do it, and taxing marijuana is not going to budget. Susanna Mendoza, just, just clarify, because as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people just feel that the, the controller's office is the check writing or the bill paying office in the state. So how does that factor into bringing down the incredible pension debt that we have? Sure. So it's not just a check writing officer. It certainly isn't under me. And, you know, my opponent mentioned the late and great Judy Bartopinka, who was a firebrand 
and she went after governors of her own party and governors of the other party because she couldn't suffer bad governors no matter who they were, and the same is true of myself. Now, bringing down that bill backlog is incredibly important because that's not just a $16.7 billion bill backlog as of a year ago, November. That number is just not a number on a spreadsheet. It represents millions of people who are devastated as a result of failure to lead in, in the state of Illinois. So I don't look at it as just a number. That, that number tells a story of many people who lost their businesses, who lost their health care, frankly, people who lost their lives under this administration. So, Again, so the, the Java controller in the past, maybe when times were good, was one of more writing checks and being ministerial. Now it's actually being the last line of defense for the people of Illinois and holding tabs and holding reckless elected officials accountable for their actions. Okay, quickly, let's return yeah. to this pension crisis and what the role of the comptroller is. Is it if we're advocating for more it's revenue? Is it advocating... It's not missing pension payments. No, so the, uh, the, my job as controller in dealing with the pensions is to make sure that under no circumstances do we miss those pension payments or miss our debt service payments. And I've been very, very strong advocate and very vocal in a way that has, frankly, calmed the markets as to how responsible I've been as controller but yet that's and not managing really through this crisis. Down yeah. the problem, and, and, and here's, here's, here's that's not this goes back. And this is what you know. This yeah, is right. what um, the comptroller should bring to the table. And again, it's 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 good financial wherewithal and sitting down and talking to people to say this is what this means if you make these sorts of decisions. And the pension problem is why we keep having unpaid bills and deficits because that keeps going up and we we don't have enough revenue there's not enough revenue in the state of okay, Illinois. Okay so what do you suggest for more revenue if, if not um, legalizing recreational marijuana or expanding gaming and, and getting the revenue from that what else do you recommend including possible cuts? You know what what I'm looking at right now is basically to, let's take control of the things we can and the pension one is a big piece of it and let's let's get control of our spending now I you know we I saw some of the good work that was done and this is with the governor's office in regards to education refunding reform and the rest so there's there's good things that are happening but our biggest piece of the pie that that keeps eating everything else up and you know I'll, I'll you know Quinn was there saying it all the time you ca you called about you know the, the python that ate everything else I mean the pie is not going to we can grow the pie as much as we want but we're going to keep taking away from those who need it most because of this pension problem. Susanna Mendoza, uh, your opponent here said that you're using this office as a bully pulpit. And uh, let me just ask you about your most recent ad mm -hmm. in which a narrator says that you are Bruce Rauner's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then you, in your own words, says, I love standing up to big bullies. So you call him a bully himself. Mm -hmm. Has your relationship been strained or non-existent uh, during your time in office? It's been non-existent, and that's unfortunate because the first thing I did when I became controller was to reach out to the governor. He never even acknowledged any of the letters that n neither myself nor the other fellow constitutional officers that serve this state had presented him phone calls. They don't get returned. He doesn't meet with the state leaders. Um, he canceled the leadership meetings about a week into my first term, the first uh, year of my first term. And, you know, it's just unfortunate. We have had to lead a resistance effort against a person who wanted to continue to hold the budget hostage for 736 days. So that's unfortunate. We hope that with the new governor, that governor will bring Democrats and Republicans together in the same way that I, as controller, managed to pass the most aggressive transparency agenda, not just with Democratic votes, with, but with almost unanimous bipartisan support. I even had a Republican state representative, Representative David McSweeney, champion and be the lead co-sponsor of one of my key uh, transparency initiatives. So, you know, I have not been political, I've just been truthful, and that's what voters sent me to do on their behalf. You wanted to respond to that? Yeah, and, and here, you know, if, if you think you're so, um, I'm a, sort of an aggressive or whatever, why didn't you, I, I mean, I've been asked to sit at tables, okay? Um, I, I don't have, I don't have people turn me away. I am asked to sit at tables sure. to solve problems. And that's what I'm gonna continue to do going forward. I will ask to be part of the budget process with everyone else to say, this is what, this is where we are, this is what it means. I'm the person that's putting the financial reporting together, so I will help explain that. And well, let you me have ask to you something. You let have me to be ask someone you, who really, who wants to work across Let me ask you something that might happen next January. So let's say that you're elected controller, and as it stands now, maybe J.B. Pritzker becomes the next n governor. Would you be able to work with him, oh, and yes. do you think that he would put pressures on your office to, to, um, to meet his agenda? You know, number one, I will be able to work with him. I've been proven, uh, again, the work I've done on Senate Bill 1 
and Quinn cited that. You know, that was something we went into a conference committee, which we don't do. So I, I can sit down and work with people, and I'll tell you how and why. You develop trust. You don't go bullying people and stabbing them in the back. You develop trust. And All right. He has it. not really be, come forward exactly. or been very clear about his graduated tax plan. Uh, what do you think of that, and what do you think should happen in, in Illinois about Taxation. That he needs to be. He needs to be clear on that. He needs to share that with individuals. What, um, what do you think? What? What? How do, should it be uh, um, structured in this state? You know, I, I, am not for a progressive tax as it stands. I think the flat tax is a better approach to where we are right now today. Uh, we've seen other states and the failures they've had with the progressive tax. They call it a fair tax, but you know, until the numbers come out, and I have seen the progressive bills that have been floated have not been fair. And, and it doesn't st still solve the problem. Susanna Mendoza, you are backing J.B. Pritzker for governor. Yes. And what do you think of his idea, although he hasn't really uh, developed it or at least uh, announced it yet? N number one, I do think that the middle class is completely overtaxed. That's why an idea of a fair tax makes sense, a progressive income tax. That would allow the majority of the middle class, if not all of it, to actually see a reduction in their taxes and make sure that people like J.B. Pritzker and Bruce Rauner definitely pay a larger share. They make a ton more than your average citizen or middle class individual in this state, and they should pay significantly more. Having said that, let me just be clear that, you know, J.B. Pritzker, when he becomes governor, and I am a supporter of his, I don't work for J.B. Pritzker, and I, I'll never work for J.B. Pritzker. I will continue to work for the people of the state of Illinois, and well, that's as, who my boss is. As you is. stated tonight, if J.B. Pritzker becomes governor yep. and Bruce Rauner isn't, then you might be running for mayor. Well, I'll look forward to working with J.B. Pritzker, but again, I won't work for him. If so. if uh, Bruce Rauner gets reelected, as you said, you will stay there for the next four years. If your relationship has been so bad, what would you do to try to rectify that? Well, I would. Con well, look, I have reached out to him on many occasions. I mean, I could supply you the documents and the letters saying I stand ready to work with you, Governor. Let us know what we can do to help. They don't even acknowledge receipt. I know they received them because they're date stamped, but. I'm not telling you anything that's unique to me. I don't even take it personally because the same story would be told to you by Treasurer Frerichs and pretty much leaders in both parties. He doesn't even have really the support of his own members. That is why I would get unanimous support on bills to override the governor. I mean, this is something we've never seen before. He really is the only person who hasn't been able to how to figure out how to navigate Springfield, and that is through building relationships. JB will be able to do that. I've proven that I can do it, and it's important in getting things done. Let me ask you about uh, something at the municipal level, because earlier this year you withheld $3.3 million from the city of Harvey mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in state funds that were intended to go to specifically the police and fire pensions there, and that was worked out uh, after a yeah. while. But is that, is, is that same thing happening here in Chicago with the fire and police uh, pensions, that uh, our share of the state funds are coming in, but they're not going into those uh, pension funds? If so, what would you do about this? So I have to follow the state law, and the state law is very clear, and it says that if there is a legitimate um, claim that is made on money that is supposed to be going to those pension funds, and that claim is made by those pension funds, then after that claim is investigated, if it's legitimate, then state law says that the state controller must intercept those funds and send them to the appropriate body, which in this case would be the pension funds. Thankfully, Harvey was able to work out an agreement without having uh, to make my office fully intercept everything and turn it over right away. They were able to work at an agreement that allows the municipality to continue to operate and the police and fire to start to get some but pension it, funds instead of no pension funds. Isn't Chicago funds. exempt from that? No, they are in some part, but not in all parts, Darlene. So yeah, and that's right part now, of that, that is, they've, there's actually a, um, uh, a claim that has been filed by the pension boards right now with our office, and that is being reviewed. The, the some fire of those police, monies, Chicago yes, pension boards? The okay. firemen. So some of that is interceptable, but not all of it. Darlene Singer, what do you think of the control, uh, controller intercept uh, policy? You know, here's, you know, again, it's, it's, pensions are the biggest part of the problem, it's the whole thing. So here's, here's what the comptroller does also do, and this is where I'll add some of these good suggestions to the table. They're responsible for the audits for municipalities and for villages. And Dixon is another example, University Park is an example. If you're actually spending time as comptroller, look at these audits. If you see them going south, say something. You know, go in and say, hey, you're having problems here. University Park was using TIF money for operations. Hey, there's a problem here. You see it. Is that the role of the something. controller, or is that the, should be the role they're, of the controller? Is that what you're suggesting? They, I would like to make that more a role of the controller to say, let's let's look at these things, so you don't get into a situation where there's an intercept. Do you agree? So there is uh, the current way it works is that those municipalities have to file their uh, reports with us, 
and we don't have actual auditing powers over each municipality. We don't technically audit them. Somebody else audits them and they file their reports with us. If there is a complaint of malfeasance, we would have the ability to then further look into that or refer that to the Auditor General, but that's not our role. Susanna, Should it be? That's a question for another Susanna day. Susanna Mendoza, let yeah. me ask you one other sure. question about your prioritization of bill payment. Yes. Because uh, you said, or you have said, that you, you sent, uh, your first priorities were like to nursing homes and, and to small businesses instead of like consulting firms that mm -hmm. uh, were part of the state. How do you decide this? And, and some are criticizing you saying it's not really your role to decide who gets paid when or where it's pay the bills. Which actually the Constitution says it is my role and the courts more importantly have confirmed that it is my role, especially during times of fiscal crisis, which remember, I walked into a crisis of the magnitude on my first day. I think we had over $11 billion due with just not even $100 million in the account essentially. So it is the role of the controller under times like these to have to determine how you prioritize. Dr. Singer, would you, would you advocate for more oversight of how well, the controller here's, pays yeah, bills? Here's, here's the problem, and this is what's happening today more so than not, because that question's coming up. When you're, when you're a controller working nine to five, and then you're I don't on work your. 9 to 5, by the way. It is a 24 and then you're on 7, the and you better hope your controller doesn't pulpit. have a 9 to 5 schedule. And you're on the bully pulpit bashing the governor nonstop, and you're doing everything to make whatever good work that's happening, and part of that is some of the contract work. You're bashing that and making it a failure. People start thinking, what are you doing? You know, can we trust that you're really doing this fairly? And um, right now, there's a lot of individuals that don't feel that way. There's a lot of needs out there, there's a lot of important work being done. But when you get someone out there that's just basically trashing all the work the governor's doing. Let's try to end on what a very a yes, good and please. quick note. Huh. Give me, tell me something that you admire about your opponent, Darlene Sanger. Um, I think Darlene is very committed to her party. And she is out and working her election, you know, supporting other Republicans and getting out to try to to connect with voters and ask for their vote. That, it's, it's important that people step up to run for office. And you know, I always say thank you to people that have the courage to step up and run. Darlene Sanger, something you admire about Susanna Mendoza? You know what, when she's out and she's talking, she's very good at sticking to her message, which you <laughs> continually do all the time. And uh, right now it's, it's, it's making sure you're working both sides of the fence so you're running for mayor well, or not. But you're very, good, you're very good at, at sticking Susanna to that Mendoza message. Susanna Mendoza and Darlene Sanger, thank you very much good. for thank being you. here tonight. We appreciate thank it. Thank you, hey, good seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. There's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, an update on a new kind of walking path below a set of train tracks. And Alpina Singh is here to preview the upcoming season of Check, Please. But first, for the past six months, former U.S. Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker and tech entrepreneur Chris Gladwin have been working on a plan to put Chicago in the top tier of technology-driven cities. Now that initiative called P33, a plan for what Chicago could be in 2033, is being presented to the public for the first time. The goal is to create a Burnham plan for tech, a blueprint for Chicago to become one of the world's leading technology hubs. Here now to tell us more is Chris Gladwin. He's a tech entrepreneur and co-founder and CEO of data analytics company Ossient. Gladwin founded the data storage company CleverSafe in 2004, which was subsequently sold to IBM for $1.3 billion in 2015. He's also the author of more than 300 issued or pending patents. Chris Gladwin, welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so flesh out the P33 initiative a little more. Well, first of all, it's a plan that we're developing with many of the constituencies in Chicago, including established businesses, entrepreneurial and tech uh, individuals, uh, civic leaders, universities. We've got a team of over 150 people that have been working on this for a long time. Penny Prisker's involvement, the former yeah. Secretary of Commerce, uh, where does she fit into this? Well, one of the things that we've learned in this process is the Chicago way of being a tech leader isn't just to have a thriving tech community, but also to have the other 90% of the businesses in Chicago, the uh, industry of Chicago, become tech leaders themselves. 
because the future of their businesses, it doesn't matter if you're in transportation or food or logistics, involves information technology. If you're not a leader in information technology, you're not going to be a leader in your industry. So one of the things we've done in P33 is to create a structure that represents both established businesses as well as new entrepreneurial technology businesses. And the, at, at the um, coordinating committee level, Penny represents the established business community and I represent the tech entrepreneurial community. When uh, we hear the word technology used so much, what do you mean by uh, what do you mean by technology? How, how do you define the term? Yeah, well, within P33, we're really focused on information technology, um, which is using information to solve business problems at the end of the day. That's really what matters. Another thing we're focused on is how you know, businesses can use that to grow and be leaders and create opportunities. You've been quoted as saying that Chicago is a solid second tier yeah. technology city. Yeah, we have. So what are the obstacles that, keep, that have been keeping it from becoming a top tier city? Well, in order to really claim credibly that you're going to become top tier, you have to first accomplish getting to where we are today. And there's been a lot of incredible work over decades by lots of people, lots of organization to get to where we are. Today, Chicago is the number one city in the United States for venture capital returns. We're number two in terms of college graduates. We're the most educated big city in the United States. There's all kinds of great things going on here, and that has gotten us into a solid second tier position. And now, because of that, we're able to say, let's go for the first tier. And to get to the first tier, what are the existing obstacles? For example, retaining talent. Uh, you mentioned that Chicago is second in terms of the, uh, that, that Chicago is second in terms of the number of venture capital returns, venture capital returns yeah. that it's, uh, that it is one of the leaders in terms of college graduates, and yet yeah. so many of those college graduates uh, go elsewhere, Silicon yeah. Valley. Apparently about 50 percent, and we have to do better. The issue in Chicago is not quality. The quality of the enterprises here, the quality of the outcomes, the quality of the people are, are absolutely first rate. That's not the issue. The issue is we need more of that. So to, in needing more of that, we need more of that talent. So um, those kind of graduates that are in the, the, the fields that really create leverage in technology, like STEM degrees and computer science, we need more of them to stay here. We need to be able to attract more of them to come here. How do you do that? Well, they, there's, it's, if there was one simple answer, it, we would have done it already. There's a lot of things to it. Um, one of the things that we found in this pro project is that if you look at the facts of Chicago and its place as a technology hub and compare that to the perception of tech workers in other tech cities, there's a big mismatch in that the reality is way ahead of the perception. So one of the things we're going to need to do is to close that gap. So when someone's making a decision, do I go to college in Chicago, do I take a job in Chicago, or you know, they're a family where the spouse is thinking, will I be able to get a job in Chicago if my spouse takes this opportunity? We need to do a better job of communicating where we're at today, all the opportunities that are here, all the accomplishment, all the assets we have as a tech city. We just heard Susana Mendoza and her, her challenger, um, Representative uh, Sanger, talk about the issues facing yeah. the state, yeah. taxes, yeah. Um, the pension liabilities yeah. and so forth. Uh, to what extent are those impediments to people coming here or people staying here? Well, the number one thing that determines whether or not a person takes a job is the job itself. And then what they also look for is future opportunities for them, so th their, their career and their spouse. That's really what drives it. So that's what we've got to communicate. In terms of creating benefits, Technology as a uh, kind of a business and job creator is the number one thing that's driven economic growth in the United States for decades. And for Chicago's $700 billion economy today to go further and create more opportunities and jobs and um, all the things that we want to do that enable civic, you know, good, we've got to grow and, and we've got to grow in technology. You alluded to this just a minute ago, but uh, I understand you did a study on how Chicago is perceived yeah. in the world of technology, and what were the findings? Yeah, we, we, had, we had about um, over a thousand people respond, and we, we wanted, and we had people respond not only in Chicago, but people in other tech cities like Austin and San Francisco and Seattle and places like that. And what you find is that everyone in a city thinks high, more highly of their city than other places. That's just kind of natural. They chose to be there. But then 
there's always a gap of how other cities are perceived by those um, who don't live there. And the truth is Chicago just underperforms. There's always a gap for every city, but the gap of Chicago in terms of how people outside of here that are in tech communities perceive the tech community here is significantly lower than it is other places. We're, we're gonna have to close that gap. How much of Chicago's technology future is dependent on the city landing the second Amazon headquarters? Well, if you look at what we're talking about, taking a $700 billion economy today, which is what Chicago is, and advancing that, you know, those are huge stakes. And we're not talking about next year, we're not talking about next week, we're talking about, you know, 15 year kind of time frame. Uh, Amazon's headquarters selection is one of many going on right now. It would be definitely a benefit for us, but it's not, it's not like we're dependent upon that. It would be a great thing, but it's not like it's essential for us to become a tech leader over the long term. So uh, speaking of the short term, what are the uh, initial steps that you're going to be taking now that you have this initiative, now that you have this blueprint, right. what do you do next? Well, what we have now is not yet the blueprint. What we have now is the initiative that we're announcing. We've assembled many of the constituencies needed ultimately for this to be successful. We're expanding the group involved and getting more input. And what we're really doing now is building that blueprint. And, and you mentioned the Burnham plan and, and a blueprint. That's a good way of thinking of it. It's not realistic to say we're going to figure out everything for everybody and just tell everyone what to do. That's not how it works. That's not how the, the Burnham plan worked. The Burnham plan was really a plan that said, here's the priorities we have in architecture. You know, like the idea of having parks and cities was an innovative idea in the Burnham plan. And so that allowed, you know, m millions of other decisions to get made to affect that. A set of objectives and we're looking to do the same thing where we define the objectives we translate those into key areas and we allow lots of people to make many decisions to implement that chris gladwin thank you so much for stopping by we appreciate it back in spring 2017 we visited the future side of a pedestrian path that was to be set below cta train tracks we recently went back for an update and now here's a look at what's become of the project and what is still to come Sitting at the intersection of Polina and Roscoe Streets is the Polina CTA L-Stop, now also the welcome mat to what's called the low line. The idea behind this space is to let people know when they're stepping off the train that they are entering the low line, they're entering Lakeview, uh, they're entering a one-of-a-kind public space. It's playful, it's, uh, it's fun, and it's unexpected. And at the end of the day, the low line is about surprising and delighting uh, people. The project was first envisioned in 2011 by the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce. The idea was to clean up and connect the space below and between the Brown Line Southport and Polina stations. Phase one wrapped up construction in late September. It includes the low line farmers market that runs through the summer and fall at the Southport stop and new seating elements and lighting at the Polina station. We more than doubled the amount of light in the Polina Plaza, which uh, immediately helps you feel like you're walking into space that is, is, uh, is looked after, is taken care of, is safe uh, and, and welcoming. And the seats, or cubbies, not only include charging stations for electronics, but also look like a familiar element found at any CTA station, the train tracks. It's a space that um, reflects the ideas that community members have been submitting over the course of the past seven years, as well as the uh, structure that surrounds us. Those community ideas have been welcomed throughout the process and will continue to help PORT, the agency responsible for designing the space, as it takes on phase two of the project. We knew it was part of a longer vision, so it was really important for us to approach the design with that longer vision in mind. Those long-term elements for phase two and beyond, new pavement, art panels, and light boxes that will work with the moving train above. Port also designed with a CTA in mind, like keeping design elements a safe distance away from the train structure. Their number one priority, obviously, is to maintain uh, transit service for users of the train. So there's just certain... Uh, things that they need for their daily operations. Phase one was funded by Special Service Area 27. That's a program that raises money through a localized property tax. But what's needed to finish phase two are contributions from the community. 
As to why anyone would want to spend time underneath the moving train, the Chamber of Commerce says the proof is in the market. I'm proud to say it entered and just completed its sixth season. So uh, we've seen a lot of changing perceptions about public space throughout this process. Uh, people are viewing um, public space differently all around the world, not as just a you know, well-trimmed patch of grass with a classically inspired fountain in the middle of it, but um, something that's a little bit more unusual that takes you out of your comfort zone. The Lakeview Chamber of Commerce estimates the cost of Phase 2 at around $350,000. It's expected to be completed around this time next year. And you can visit our website for more information. Up next, Alpina Singh previews the new season of Check, Please. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Get ready to raise your glasses, Check Please fans. The season premiere of your favorite restaurant review show airs tomorrow. And this time the show returns with a familiar face <laughs> and a familiar laugh. I just heard a little <laughs> bit of it. Alpina Singh is back to hosting Check Please after a five-year hiatus. And let's take a quick look. So, Don, tell us about the ambiance and sort of the decor of the restaurant. It's an open space. The artwork that's on the one wall is his. He also paints. Next time you go, mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for a bottle of wine, I love Albarino with Mexican food. There's just something mm -hmm. about the bright. It's like lime juice that sort of, you know, that sort of, you know, perfectly matches with the dish. It's actually from Spain, but if you need a good bottle, bring a bottle of Albarino. And here to talk this season of Check Please is host. Alpina Singh. Alpina, good to see you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, backtrack just a little bit. Explain why the five-year hiatus. What happened five years ago? I was very busy. I was busy opening three restaurants, and, you know, I ran a marathon. I hosted a, I was a judge on a TV show for Food Network, and so I was keeping pretty busy, but I definitely missed everybody at the show. So you've, uh, uh, you have actually taped 12 episodes so far, even though the first one airs tomorrow. What is it like being back in the saddle again? Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's just, I just miss the show so much, and it's been really nice just spending the summer, and, and of course, news of my return, you know, earlier this summer, so people, you know, been stopping in the street, I hear you're coming back. Is it true? I'm like, yes, it's true. You know, so the, the fan reaction has been extremely positive, and it feels definitely good to be back. So how, in five years, I mean, five years can be an eternity uh, <laughs> in different professions and in the restaurant business. Oh, yes. I mean, it is such a Darwinian kind of a scene. How has the restaurant scene changed in the five years that you have been on hiatus? Well, I would say that the number one thing that I'm very happy to see is that Chicago is finally recognized as a world-class dining destination. You know, we now host the James Beard Awards. We're an incubator for emerging chef talent, but we also are a bastion of these wonderful ethnic eateries that are owned by, you know, people that want to share a piece of their culture. So we have something to offer in terms of everything. You know, our, our food landscape is just as diverse as our citizens. Oh, okay. So you've done 12 of the episodes so far. You still have to do a few more. Is that it? We have a, yeah, we have a so what can people look forward to this season? Is it uh, sort of in the spirit of the past? Are you taking it in a different direction? How would you describe the it? The best part of the show is not going to change. You know, that's what people love about Check, Please. So we're still featuring three everyday Chicagoans, recommending reviewing their favorite restaurants. But what has changed is sort of how we engage with the restaurants in terms of social media and online presence. And to that, we're actually featuring a new component where the creator of the show, David Mantle, and I have uh, recorded webisodes. So it's a video series to accompany each episode where we take the viewer behind the scenes mm. and talk about various elements of the show that that have come up that we find interesting we want to talk more about it so we hope that people will tune in on wttw.com um, slash check please to check out those those webisodes and uh, give me an idea of what you'll get on a web uh, give me an example of something you'll see on a webisode that you wouldn't have seen in well, the main just, one just the emergence of like instagram and facebook and twitter you know and also how we use you know uh we, we use websites we research the restaurants beforehand we check out the menu we look at the photo we kind of 
plan what we're going to eat. And then once we're at the restaurants, we're photographing the dishes and we're sharing it on those social media channels. Uh, a, a term that I kept hearing throughout the season was, oh, it's Instagram worthy. Like the restaurant's oh, beautiful. <laughs> you know, I have to take a photo. Like, don't touch it. And we all have people in our family where we got to dinner like, don't touch it. I have to get a photo first. You know, so that has certainly changed in, in the last five years. It wasn't a presence. It's now more so a presence. Well, uh, along those lines, to what extent is a show like Check, Please still as relevant or as engaging given the fact you can go online and you can get so many reviews. There's so much information online that may not have been there say five years ago. I think what is unique about Check Please is that the restaurants have been reviewed uh, and recommended, more importantly, by everyday Chicagoans. They're not food critics. But the other element is we're not chasing just the new. You know, we feature restaurants that you've probably driven by for the last 15 years, always wondered what it's like. And that is really important, especially for restaurant tours. You know, hiring a, a publicist is extremely expensive, but giving these restaurants that may have fallen off the heat list or the heat map or new restaurant openings a chance that people just, you know, giving them the eyeballs of like, you should go and eat there and check them out. It's delicious. It's wonderful. There's been a family operating this business for 20 years. Please go support them. Check out the neighborhoods. Get in, you know, get out of your comfort zone and discover what the city has to offer. You know, we were just showing that video of uh, different restaurants. And one thing that hasn't changed is the quality of the photography. My oh, God, yes. It makes your mouth water. Yes. Check Leaves is definitely a pioneer in giving you that sort of hypnotic. You're sitting at home like, I want to go there right now sort of like you imagine yourself you know twirling the pasta eating the cake you know putting the butter on smush, the biscuit putting the, yeah smushing the egg yolk it's just it's quite luscious that's the word that comes to mind well we've touched on uh, maybe how the restaurant scene has changed but how have you changed in five years Oh, wow. I mean, I was 26 years old when I first started hosting this show. I'm so 41 I, now, so oh it's, it's 15 years. I, I've eaten a lot more you food. You look like you're still in your 20s. <laughs> Thank you. You always say that. I always appreciate it's that. It's true. Thank you. I've eaten a lot more food. I've traveled a lot more. I just have a lot more life experience behind me, and I, I bring to the table a little bit more sort of the settled sort of experience and understanding and knowing and just being a little bit more comfortable in my own skin, which comes with age, which comes with time. I think the process of getting older is not celebrated nearly enough as it should as in our culture. I see. Well, one of the things that you've done during it, and you alluded to it, was the fact that you opened some restaurants. How has that affected your, your, uh, your role as host? I mean, do you... Do you have extra empathy for restaurants that are reviewed now? The, my role as host is to, I, I'm not there to offer my own opinion, but it's really to sort of guide the conversation. So if something comes up, for example, this season we had somebody who was a vegan and expressed like when I go to restaurants, it tends to be a little difficult trying to accommodate me, but she did say that she calls in advance. I stepped in immediately and said, that's absolutely wonderful. As a restaurant owner, the more information that you can provide, particularly if you have dietary restrictions, the more seamless the experience is for both sides. So I only know that now because I own restaurants and I know what it's like to deal with on the spot. You know, Al, you don't want to make somebody sick. You want to make sure that you accommodate <laughs> right. them. What so. else have you learned as a restaurant owner that sort of has changed your perspective in some way? I've learned that the, it's a very difficult business, but most importantly, restaurant owners want to get it right. They don't wake up in the morning thinking, okay, how am I going to ruin somebody's dinner tonight? And how personal everything is and how passionate we are about making sure that people have a good experience and how much it actually hurts us when people don't. You know, sort of that, it, it crushes you when you, you, you have, you put everything, your heart and soul into this entity and people come in and you just hope that they have a great time and how devastating it really is when they don't. It's almost like, ugh, I let people down. And, and we take it personally, you know, but we try to, we do our best to try to make it right. You know, if I, I, uh, I wake up and, you know, go talk to my staff of like, we just got to make sure that this is somebody's birthday, this is somebody's anniversary. People come in and they want to spend their money with us and we want to make sure they have a great time. Another thing that, that uh, people may not know about you is that you are active in women's issues. For example, there's a, there's a, there's one, uh, there's one project that you work with particularly. Tell us about that. I'm an avid supporter of Deborah's Place, which is an organization that provides supportive housing for women. And what they do is just the basic dignity of having a place to call your own, a home. And they provide everything from job place, uh, job training assistance, job placement services. And what really got me interested in, in working with them was the first time I toured the property and this woman had taken me into her apartment. 
and she stood there and I was standing in her apartment. She says, this is, I haven't had a home for 10 years. And this is the first place that I've been able to call mine. And just that, that basic dignity. And it really put me in a place to be, to express more gratitude for all the gifts that I've been getting, given. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day everything of life that you forget sometimes how fortunate we really are. Amen to that. Alpina Singh, welcome back. We're fortunate to have you. Thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> good to have you back. And are you nostalgic for some old school check please? You can flash back to 2003 on our website where you can watch Alpina's debut as check please host in the show's third season. The new season of check please as we mentioned premieres tomorrow night at 8 o'clock and Chicago Tonight is back in just a moment. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Stay connected by signing up for our daily briefing and please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.